There are very few things in Serbia that are as fetishized as monarchy is. This symbol and metaphor of stability, of the rule of law, and the spirit of the good old times and of long-lost national integrity and prestige has seeped into the minds of a noticeable amount of people who are understandably disappointed in and alienated from the current political order and are looking for a trustworthy alternative. Whereas the monarchist political platform is in absolute terms rather insignificant, with only seven seats in the National Assembly, held by the movement for the restoration of the Kingdom of Serbia, the prospect of monarchism has colloquially become a commonplace political consideration among the disenfranchised masses, who nostalgically yearn for some kind of old former glory, national stability, traditional family values, and other sentimental mysticisms in the midst of an ever-decaying socio-economic order. Religious superstitions of the politically active Serbian Orthodox Church further fuel this very narrative with well-established paroles about the lost values of spiritualism, tradition, modesty, national health, and the necessary cultural reawakening, embodied in the kingdoms and empires of old. This is then further politically instrumentalized in the name of national interests and national integrity, Classical bourgeois platitudes used to mobilize masses for the sake of territorial conquest and violent suppression of autonomies and rights of ethnic minorities for the interests of the ruling elite. So the purpose of this video is not to condescendingly dismiss or mock these ideas, but to carefully examine their faulty premises and superstitious naivety, as well as the harm they inevitably lead to. My aim is to showcase how such understandable and completely valid objections to the ever-decaying social fabric of the prevailing system can nonetheless be misled and misdirected, how their lazy and rushed interpretation can make them victims of political weaponization for the interests of yet another set of elites, for the regressive and elitist interests of the most reactionary elements in society. We will talk about monarchy, its authentic historical role, and contemporary reality. We shall talk about the traditional values it espouses, and the backward and inhumane consequences of its historical and potentially contemporary political implementation, devoid of utopian mysticism that its adversaries faithfully employ. This should then hopefully showcase how naive and irresponsible it is to glorify historical instances of monarchy for the purposes of enhancing modern national mysticisms, chauvinisms, and territorial claims by promoting pseudo-historical versions of former kingdoms, empires, and monarchist guerrillas whose political rehabilitation leads to the shameless whitewashing of history and relativization of their crimes. Now, in order to fully appreciate the monarchist position and their general philosophical framework, I think it's most fair to take a look at their publicly displayed political platform and associated values, which can be found on the official website of the Movement for the Restoration of the Kingdom of Serbia under the section, What Do We Stand For? Naturally, there may be different flavors of monarchists with varying positions on specific issues, but this is nonetheless irrelevant to the criticisms which I'm about to present regarding the very philosophical and economic foundation of their thought. Time has shown that since our country has been a republic, different political parties may come to power, but there will be no substantial change. Only with a change in the form of governance, from a republic into a constitutional parliamentary kingdom, can we achieve true systemic change in Serbia, progress and development. At the outset, we see their obvious contempt towards the liberal capitalist order to traditional bourgeois politics involving parliamentary procedures, embodied by dozens of political parties, sponsored by a handful of billionaires and tycoons, a overall corrupt and rotten system whose failures and deficiencies are self-evident to most working class people. However, here's where the predators of reaction come in. Monarchy is presented as a way out of this circus that nobody believes in anymore. 
They're using the discontent of the masses with the current political establishment and feeding them with empty promises of resurrecting a bygone era that none of them ever actually experienced. An era surrounded by a fantastical aura of traditionalist grandeur that, in theory, starkly contrasts modern decadence, hedonism, and immorality that everyone rightly detests. This promise of resetting society back to a time where everything used to be fine and dandy would indeed be wholesome if it was truly possible or honest. But, as it always is with reactionary and regressive forces, the witness called history tends to expose their dishonest obscuration and mystification of the outdated system that had kept our region in a backward state for centuries and whose primitivist legacy they are trying to rehabilitate. Yes, their assertion that there will never be any substantial change under a parliamentary republic is indeed correct, but is followed by a very problematic twist. Their counter-suggestion to the deficiencies of bourgeois politics is arguably even worse for the average working class person, and seems to contain a Machiavellian echo of the past, namely the reasoning of the 6th of January dictatorship in the former Kingdom of Yugoslavia. With this, I am referring to the period in Yugoslav history when King Alexander I of the Karadjordjevic dynasty responded to the decade-long failures and insolvable contradictions of Yugoslav parliamentarism by introducing a military dictatorship that outlawed all political parties, introduced mass censorship, disbanded parliament and concentrated power into the hands of himself as the ruling monarch. This strongman political move of 1929 was nothing but a reflection of the inability of the Serbian bourgeoisie to tame the fuming national, economic and political contradictions within the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes, to solve the national question and advance the productive forces of the country. This hegemonic attempt of the Serbian king to bring the marauding tribes of the Frankenstein creation that he renamed to the Kingdom of Yugoslavia under his control through the forceful obstruction of bourgeois democratic procedures that were self-evidently fruitless and destructive, clearly gives us a historical precedent for the contemporary mumblings of restoring the Kingdom of Serbia due to the failures of bourgeois democracy that is openly subservient to the interests of imperialism. Although modern monarchist charlatans may claim that the restoration of the Kingdom would free us from this deadlock and initiate progress and development, our own history shows us that this kind of reaction to a crumbling establishment can only lead to the exact opposite. A proto-fascist regime that will only sharpen these contradictions to the point where actual fascist and Nazi ghouls show their ugly faces in supposed self-defense, just like the Ustasche were thus given a justification for their existence and subsequent crimes against humanity on the basis of rejecting the tyranny of this newly founded pro-Serbian hegemonic aberration that tried to cement the political predominance of one people group at the expense of others. However, this is not to say that a renewed resurrection of monarchist social relations would yield identical results in this historical situation and in the context of the Serbian state. That would be naive and ahistorical. The point that I'm trying to hammer home is that we have witnessed the ocean of socioeconomic contradictions of the monarchist platform on our own soil firsthand, barely 100 years ago, with the horrors and atrocities of World War II as its tragic consequences. It is thus our intellectual duty to investigate these failures and injustices and stop those who try to relativize and obscure them for their own political agenda. Pretending that parliamentary monarchy is something noble and benevolent is not only intellectually dishonest for ignoring the well-documented historical instances of its tragic existence, but it also indicates that we care more about national mysticism and royalist intrigue than we do about the actual social and economic well-being of the average working class person that lay forgotten behind layers of spectacular golden facades and metaphysical veils. In order to investigate the class content and actual socioeconomic consequences of monarchist hegemony, let us address yet another pretentious point that Serbian monarchists try to package as something noble. Namely, how, quote, by restoring the Kingdom of Serbia, we would immediately improve her prestige in the world, 
placing her among the most prestigious European monarchies. We will have a stable country and national unity. Not a single president of the Republic has managed to unite the ruling and opposition parties around crucial national questions. Only the king has managed to do so. Today, Serbs need unity above all else. First things first, the quote-unquote prestige they're boasting about and the sacred place among the glorified European monarchies is a childish myth. The laws of the capitalist socio-economic order are immune to superficial medieval notions of national prestige, popularized in movies and TV shows that depict feudal relations as spectacles of royalist intrigue that have nothing to do with actually prevailing socio-economic dynamics of that era and less so of our current one. Moreover, those very prestigious European monarchies have for centuries been bastions of state-sponsored terrorism and colonial genocide over native populations all over the planet, but also of the Balkan Peninsula itself, of untold atrocities and crimes against humanity of the Spanish, British and French empires, whose contemporary remnants serve as symbolic relics celebrating this hegemonic past which has slowly transitioned from full-blown colonialism and imperialism into more subtle neo-colonial arrangements that try to whitewash the bloodstains of hundreds of millions of people from their shiny crowns. This desperately yearned prestige in the world scene draws its roots from the relatively favorable position of the Serbian Kingdom and the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats and Slovenes in the power constellation of continental Europe in the two world wars. It's an echo of petty desperation to be accepted by the great imperialist powers and have them quote-unquote on our side, as we did in the past, until they ultimately turned their backs on us as soon as their interests shifted, ignoring the self-serving and hegemonic nature of this support and alliance throughout history. Boasting about British, French or Russian sympathies from the past is ridiculous, considering the subservient and practically colonized position of the Serbian and Yugoslav states in these arrangements in the epoch of this allegedly glorious international prestige. Furthermore, a stable country and national unity when it comes to crucial national questions is a fairy tale, conjured up by those who ignorantly dismiss the class divisions within every given nation state, and the further petty sectarian differentiations of the ruling stratum itself, with various bourgeois groupings, organizations and parties that will inevitably hold very different views on social, political and economic issues, all nonetheless united around the prospect of protecting capitalism. Insisting how these different fractions of the ruling class and all socio-economic classes within a given nation-state can be magically united under one iron fist, that of a king or a president, carries the seeds of a well-known ideology whose catastrophic consequences of violent Bonapartism and class collaborationism have traumatized mankind indefinitely. Those who promote such an approach are in fact no different than the cheerleaders of King Alexander I, of Benito Mussolini or of Adolf Hitler in their conquest for power and dictatorial rule. Enforced national unity is synonymous with fascism. Then they say that we will do better at protecting our vital national interests, especially in Kosovo and Metohija and in the Republika Srpska. The national interests of the Serbian working class in Kosovo and those in Republika Srpska are matters of those very populations themselves. Each and every native population ought to fight for self-determination and negotiate its political and economic position in its own name. The state of Serbia has no business in determining the destiny of ethnic Serbs in any neighboring country unless we consider such platitudes about national interests for what they truly are, regional imperialist endeavors of securing the political and economic interests of the Serbian ruling class or the economies, industries and national resources of said neighboring countries. Moreover, their conceptions of how, in the Kingdom of Serbia, the influence of the Serbian Orthodox Church on society will increase, there shall be unity between the church and the state in important decision making for the people and the state, and how monarchy is the holy name of Serbia are catastrophic on so many levels. 
the political alliance between church and state is bound to be oppressive towards all religious and ethnic minorities that do not comply with the ethno-nationalist dogma of the ruling class and their clerical allies. Serbia is a surprisingly ethnically mixed country, so increased political influence of the church would inevitably lead to forced assimilation, mass suffering and institutional oppression of all non-Serb peoples in Serbia. As for the king, he would allegedly be chosen from the ranks of the quote-unquote authentic Karadjordjevic dynasty, the same one that signed a pact with Hitler before it was overthrown by the people and exiled to the United Kingdom where they reside to this day, with an embarrassingly weak knowledge of their native language and no regard for the socio-economic situation of the Serbian people. Mingling with the court seats of the European monarchies, disconnected and alienated from the vast laboring masses, as monarchs always inevitably are. There is nothing in the political competence or legitimacy of monarchs and their lapdogs that would make them quote-unquote authentically eligible for just waltzing back in and being assigned absurd amounts of power. Based on what? On the fact that this one particular family has a historical record of having ruled these lands? On the basis of some divine assignment and metaphysical qualities? I think human civilization has progressed far enough for us to part ways with such primitive and naive conceptions of political legitimacy and accountability. After the king has been chosen, he will be inherited by his descendants, who are from childhood going to be brought up and educated for this very call, in the most prestigious schools, universities and military academies, to love their motherland, to protect and fight for her, for her development and prosperity. First of all, based on what metrics are the members of this authentic royal dynasty supposed to be given such premium attendance in these prestigious schools, universities and academies, or any elitist privileges at that, compared to the average working class person that is shoved into an outdated, expensive and useless educational system? What makes them more eligible for this kind of elitist treatment, and why would you, as their potential subordinate subject, grant them this kind of privilege, based on absolutely nothing? Oh, but we're talking about statesmen, you may say, who need pristine education to learn to truly love their motherland, to protect and fight for her, for her development and prosperity, as they unironically claim. Well, let me shock you with the fact that there are millions of pupils and students crammed into underfunded schools and corrupt universities who are much more capable and intelligent and would make much better leaders and administrators than the nepotist bureaucracy and elitist circles of every monarchic system whose only source of legitimacy is the continuity of their paternal lineage and inheritance and accumulation of wealth and private property over generations. And who the hell needs prestigious education to know to love their motherland? It's quite remarkable how they've managed to make this natural instinct of every human being into an elitist quality that only the chosen ones can understand and fulfill. Love towards the motherland was shown in the war of national liberation during the fascist occupation in World War II, where the peasant and working masses revolted against the fascist occupiers and liberated Yugoslavia whereas the royal suite fled before the responsibilities and dangers of civil war, passively supporting their royalist Chetnigarias, who turned out to be traitors and collaborators. The king isn't appointed by parties, tycoons, domestic or foreign agencies. He answers only to his people. Well, he may not be directly appointed by any fraction of the bourgeoisie, this however does not make him any closer to his people or infallible to the pressures of bourgeois and aristocratic power dynamics. Every monarch is raised and educated in the spirit of protecting the interests of the domestic landowning aristocracy, bureaucracy and bourgeoisie against internal and external threats in the form of revolutionary labor movements or rivaling aristocracies. He may not be appointed or installed through traditional parliamentary procedures, but is nonetheless a personification and symbol of an ancient socio-economic order that favors landlords, aristocrats, nobles and capitalists, and seeks to protect semi-feudal hegemony against any semblance of progress. This is the stability that is promised with the prospect of monarchy, stability of the private property of the ruling class, whatever form it may take. 
Thus, their ramblings about the role of the king as the protector of the interests of the people and the state against corrupt politicians consciously conflate the interests of the working class with those of the state that is designed to oppress it, presenting the nation as a harmonious whole that needs a stable father figure to guide it. Also, when it comes to the extent of foreign influence, all Balkan monarchies have always been insignificant petty aristocracies with regional aspirations, but always subject to the will of larger empires – Russia, France, Austria-Hungary, the Ottomans, etc. The promise of national sovereignty and self-determination is therefore cynical to the very core. The only semblance of national sovereignty that a region has ever had had been under Yugoslav self-management, personified by Josip Broz Tito, with all of its mistakes and deficiencies. So, if all this is truly the case, why do so many Serbians fetishize and glorify monarchy as this ultimate nostalgic solution to all our troubles? Why do we feverishly glorify the Serbian Empire of Tsar Dusan and the Battle of Kosovo from the 14th century as some deeply embedded national heritage of modern Serbia? Even though the concept of a nation did not exist back then, but was only invented in the 19th century with the bourgeois revolutions that took Europe by storm. The very people who ruled those empires and kingdoms, as well as those under their dominion, didn't consider themselves Serbs and would be quite confused if you label them as one. So why do we keep insisting on retroactively appropriating these great historical figures and moments of those who came before us, and packaging them into a tidy mythological image that fits our modern chauvinist inclinations? Why do we still have Chetniks and monarchists yelling Još majke radje obiliće, promising dogodine u prizrenu, singing songs of Danica Crnogočević, pledging loyalty za kralja i otačbinu? Well, the answer to this question is rather disheartening. First of all, we're witnessing a politically conscious rehabilitation of infamous Chetnik commanders and leaders by the Serbian state itself in an attempt to rewrite the historical role of the Chetniks as the legitimate anti-fascist representatives of the Serbian people in the national liberation struggle, thus relativizing their crimes and role as open collaborators with Nazi Germany and the regime of the Ustasha. We have now seen the successful rehabilitation of Draža Mihajlović, Nikola Kalabić, Milan Radivojevic Crni and others, with the simultaneous dismissal of the role of the partisans and the communists. Secondly, it is the promotion of national chauvinism, with ghosts of the past as the perfect tool for decorating this national myth that often has little to do with actual historical reality. These ghosts are the conservative values of hypermasculinity and militarism, and the alleged purity of Eastern Orthodox values, embodied in these fantastical reconstructed imaginations of the Chetnik movement, of Serbian kingdoms of empires of old and the Serbian Orthodox Church. These ghosts feed the egotism and chauvinism of the average person, giving them a feeling of pride and content, while perfectly complementing the goal of the ruling elite, which is the preservation of existing property relations and the prevailing socio-economic system. The Serbian capitalist class is perfectly confident in the infallibility of their rule, and is therefore not afraid to allow regressive and conservative forces to express their quasi-revolutionary ideas and even openly promote them, just like they haven't been shy to pass the wheel to fascists when their hegemony was starting to be put in question by the revolutionary wave of the masses. This is the role that monarchism plays in the grand scheme of things, the role of a safety backup for capital in case the organized fury of the working class ever manages to endanger it. Unsurprisingly, they advocate for reinstating traditional family values and are strictly against same-sex marriage. I've talked about this conservative phenomenon in these two videos of mine, which I advise you to check out. Then they go on about protecting children from alcoholism and drugs, introducing a 12am curfew for all kids younger than 16, which may sound like a strict yet necessary measure to combating hedonism and hooliganism, until you realize that a large portion of people who jerk off to monarchy and traditional values are ironically everything they claim to be against. 
Another talking point of theirs would be that of migrants, who they expectedly find repulsive and would like to see a dismissal of the shameful contract with the EU that compelled Serbia to accept migrants from the Middle East. They tend to view these people, who lost their homes and livelihoods due to imperialist war, as some alien predators who've come to steal our jobs, women, destroy our culture and impose their religion on us, perhaps a traumatic episode of our troubled past with the Ottoman Turks, but an inexcusable one from the perspective of basic human decency. So, at the end of the day, with the plethora of misguided fears and wants, fed to them by the very same ruling class they swear to overthrow, all those who believe that any form of monarchy might liberate us from the current deadlock are heavily deceived. Only consciously organized action of the working class, directed against the hegemony of capital and private property, can release our society from the shackles of corruption, politics, bureaucracy and the rule of the few. Not some glorified family of ultra-wealthy nobles and aristocrats who we are asked to trust and follow. There is no single divine savior we must wait for to solve all of our problems and guide us out of the darkness. We must be our own saviors, and only class consciousness and collective action can give us a chance. <laughs>